Um, and so we have three lovely ladies presenting today. Um, so the topic is speech and language. Um, super exciting um, because speech and language affects everything, impacts everything. So um, it's really exciting to get some tips. So um, we have Andrea, Miss Andrea, we have Miss Kirsten and Miss Marie presenting today. So a couple of things to just chat about real fast. Um, we are, um, if everyone can go ahead and mute themselves if they're not muted yet. Um, and so we'll kind of keep you on mute just for feedback and all that kind of stuff. And then sometimes um, you might have to, just think if the internet's not working properly, you can always like jump out and then rejoin the meeting and we'll make sure to let you back in if, it's, if there's kind of technical difficulties. But um, we did receive quite a few questions that will be addressed during the meeting. But if you have other questions, um, there's a chat feature on here. So you can just um, use the chat feature and type a question in there, or you can unmute um, if you feel comfortable and want to share. Um, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question or give your example. So anyway, um, we do have usually about three, I would say, on average, don't you think, Addie? Three on average a month of different parent groups that we're offering. So Addie is from Parents as Teachers. And uh, parents and teachers and Barfield, we uh, teamed up together to just provide these parent groups for everybody. So um, if you do not currently have parents, it's a uh, parents and teacher, uh, goodness, a parent educator, um, you should sign up. It's completely free and um, they can come in your home and and just help you work through situations. I both of my kiddos. Uh, even though I'm a teacher, I still, it's so nice to have an outside perspective and to help you through some trying situations. So parents as teachers is wonderful. So um, be sure to check out every month though, because we do have many, many topics um, and a lot of really new topics this year, really exciting topics that we're able to offer um, since we are doing everything virtual now, we can offer more. So uh, let's get started. So we have Miss Andrea. Miss Marie and then Miss Kirsten, and they're all three speech and language pathologists here at uh, Barfield Early Childhood. So excited to have you ladies. Okay, first technical difficulty. Thanks, Tara. Well, we'll go ahead and get you guys started. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to this presentation in the past. It's pretty um, similar to what we've done before. We did add in a few things based on the questions that were submitted. And then any questions that were very specific and we didn't answer throughout the presentation, I did make a list of those at the end. So we'll make sure to get to those and answer all of your questions. Um, so it is pretty much the same presentation if you've seen it before, but our hope is always that, you know, a year ago, you know, it's been a year, so hopefully, you know, you're in a different place, a different level with your child, and hopefully there are things that you can pick up on this year that might benefit you that maybe you weren't ready for in the past. So um, be looking for, you know, maybe just one or two things that you could possibly pick up to start incorporating into your home and your lifestyle, because you, you can't do everything. So just think maybe one or two things that you could pick up that you think you could easily do that might be helpful to you. Um, these are just ideas to help you enrich your home. So just, you know, hopefully take what you can, leave what you can't, and um, hopefully we'll get some, some good ideas for you. Um, okay, I think that's it. We can go to the next slide. So our goals today are to provide strategies for promoting speech and language in your home, talk about what is typical speech and language development versus what is atypical, highlight some ways to build speech and language into play and daily routines, things that you're doing anyway in your home, and uh, to demonstrate how to use visual strategies for enhancing language. This is something that we've added in that's new, so I'm hoping um, that can help too.
really this little girl was trying to communicate a lot of things. I don't know if this has ever happened at your house. It's happened at my house a few times. This is actually one of Kirsten's little girls many years ago. She is trying to communicate a lot of things that maybe what she was originally intending to communicate was not going over very well, but there are a lot of things communicated in what she's trying to say. And a lot of things are nonverbal when you're communicating. You can learn so much based on just watching the other person and um, not even listening to what they're saying. And, you know, we get a lot of kids that come into our school and I've heard parents say, well, you didn't even really talk to them. Well, we can learn so much about how they're communicating just by watching. So communicating without words, the gurgling, laughing, smiling, babbling, that's how the babies communicate. Making eye contact is major communication throughout life. It can tell you a lot of things if someone's looking at you or not. Gesturing and pointing, a lot of kids will do that when they're unable to form the words correctly. Nodding and head shakes can get you a solid yes, no, that can help communication move forward tremendously. Physical leading, if your child leads you to what they want, it's just another way to try to communicate. Watching their facial expressions, sometimes their facial expressions will tell you something that their words are not telling you. Um, crying, obviously, is a way to communicate. And then avoiding, too, or changing your proximity to something is a way to communicate. So this is a video about some missed opportunities. Not getting like a snake. You see it? It's an S. So we have S and B. Look here. Oh, I love this one. N. N. You say it. N. N. Good. Look, mommy. Oh, that's great, honey. Now go pick up that stuff in the hallway and put it back in the thing. You know, the big green one. in the hallway and put it back in the thing. You know, the big green one. I don't know if anybody else, if it was just me, but the sound is not lining up with the video on that. So we'll, hopefully that will work itself out. Okay, so the, I'm gonna tell you about a few strategies that we use to help getting kids to talk. One of the first strategies is sign language. Um, I did tell you there on the corner how to, you know, you can turn your camera on and let me know if you're bored by using sign language if you need to. Um, but we use sign language a lot. I used it with my kids when they were babies. I use it um, a lot of times. It's kind of an instant gratification way to get a kid communicating. It really takes the frustration out because they can immediately get what they need. It can increase their vocabulary. 
improve their attention and eye contact when somebody's hands are flying you around, you know, it goes right to your face. Um, I mean, your eyes probably went right to that video of the guy saying he was bored. Um, so the eye contact really helps. It makes use of multi-sensory input and output. So, you know, you have the tactile and you have the audio, audio and you have the um, visual. So all of those sensory inputs can just, you, know, you never know how a child's gonna learn. And they might learn better with a visual. They might learn better just hearing it. You just never know. So, you know, hedging your bets and doing all of those at once can really help. Um, and it can allow the child to demonstrate their, their true expressive language ability. If they just are not able to get those words out, they can do it a lot of times by using sign language. And it does not take the place of talking. It does provide a bridge um, between the nonverbal and the verbal, and it reduces frustration and encourages verbal communication sooner. I know a lot of people are worried that if I teach them sign language, they're not going to talk. And the research shows and the experience shows that it's actually the opposite. It can really help. So you wanna begin with some natural gestures. Um, you know, eat is a really easy one that is pretty natural. Um, naming words, action words, describing words, prepositions, you know, in, on. Just kind of go with what you need first. What are your most frustrating times? Start with a food time, work with eat and more and cookie. And, um, you know, you can look these words up on your phone. It's so much easier now. You can just you know, check out what you need and you don't have to learn ASL as American Sign Language. It's its own language. It has its own sentence structures. You don't have to learn that. You can just learn some basic words that would help you and your family and use those. Um, incorporate them into your everyday routine. Maybe you start with a meal time, then maybe you work up to, you know, a, a few things, a few signs you might need at bath time. Accept and reinforce modified attempts. They're, it's okay if the child doesn't use the sign the correct way. If you know what they're trying to say and they know what they're trying to say, then you should just go with it. Just like kids don't pronounce words the correct way the first time. But as you encourage them and they get excited that you knew what they were saying, it gets better and better and better and the signs will too. And there are always those one or two words that are unique to your child that they remember when, our daughter used to say this word and it was so cute. You know, there, it'll be that way for signs too and that's perfectly okay. And always, always pair the sign with the spoken word. Let them hear it and see it. So another strategy that we use a lot is called self-talk. So basically you're just talking about what you're doing all day and it is like talking to yourself. You know, use an animated voice, short, simple language, Use a language level that your child understands. Maybe your child is not using any words yet. So when you're doing self-talk, you wanna use one to two words. If your child is using two words and you want them to use four words, then bump that up. And when they use two words, you do three or four words. So there's some examples here. Um, you know, when you're, when you're doing breakfast, I'm making cereal, first I get the bowl, then I do this, then I do this, let's pour it in. But if your child is really not speaking, then you might say, breakfast, bowl, spoon, cereal, milk. So you just have to modify it for your level. And I think there's an example on the next slide. In, lid in, cup in, lid in, straw in, bowl in, lid in, bowl in, lid in. the ball. Ball in, lid in. Rinse 
vegetable. Lemon. Bowl in. Lemon. Lid in. Lemon. Cup in. Push drawer. Get down. Push drawer. Let's draw in. Close it up. Close door. Finish. So that was my daughter. She's now four and a half. Um, but you can tell she really loved the dishwasher. Every chance she got, she wanted to stand on the door of the dishwasher and take all of the dishes out. But, you know, she didn't have many words at that point. I can't remember how old she was. She was standing up. She must have been one. So she really had a couple words. But so I was using two words at a time most of the time. And that is what she needs to hear. Okay, the next strategy, oh, I really like this one, is withholding. So withholding encourages your child to initiate language and be independent about it. Um, wait time is huge. You need to just intentionally wait before giving your child everything that they want. If they don't initiate, give them an expectant look. You can do a temptation, which we'll talk about next time. Um, you might say, you know, cheerio. Um, if your child makes an attempt, you give them the item immediately and praise, 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 praise. So you might um, hold back a puzzle piece, maybe give them their oatmeal without the spoon, forgetting um, an item of clothing they need. And I think that there is a video on this too. In the video being a distraction. We'll see her in a minute. <gasps> So we also work on the kind of a first one's free philosophy. You have to get them hooked. But we do usually say, you know, first one's free and then you get them, you figure out what they want. They have to want it. She's eating raspberries, I think. And there's the distraction. There she is reaching. We know she wants it. She's pointing more. more. She signed more, and she made a verbalization with it. More raspberries. There's the model of the two words the, um, expanding. So if she wasn't distracted, this probably would have gone a little quicker. I and mean, there's the temptation. We're gonna hook her back in there. There we go. More raspberries. So, you know, you can practice this for two minutes and then move on with your day. It doesn't mean your whole meal has to go this slowly. More. There you go. She really wants it and she's using the sign for more. After she reaches, she points. Okay, so the temptations I talked about, stop helping. Let your child try to figure things out on their own and let them communicate what they need or they want. We're so ingrained to anticipate everything that our child needs and wants, and we think it's our job to make sure that they have everything they need or they want, which is true, but it's also our job to teach them how to be independent and teach them how to get what they want. So, you know, give them the jar of bubbles with the lid really tight, eat a snack in front of them without offering you any, give them a toy that hasn't been turned on, give them an opportunity to communicate with you and make that communication an expectation. So, you know, you don't just give them everything they want, they have to communicate for it. And in my house, you have to communicate politely to get what you want. Um, you know, you could put something, a favor toy in a box with a tight lid, you can put the things that they really want on top of the refrigerator, and it can be positive or negative. Um, you know, the power of saying no is big, and I think sometimes we forget to teach that because we want to please our kids all the time, which is 
fine. Um, but you know, if you try to put a great big scoop of something they don't like on their plate, they're going to learn how to say no thank you very, very quickly. And that's a very useful skill. Here's another one. My daughter loved what was in this little box, but they were so little. I kept them in this box. Open. And I think it was a little glitchy, but she did do the, the sign for open. Um, the pieces in there were so little that we kept them in that box she couldn't open so that she had to ask for it because we didn't want her to have those when I wasn't around. So expanding, again, just trying to use a couple more words than your child is already using. If they're using one to two words, then you use three to four words. Follow your child's lead because they're only going to talk about what they want to talk about. You can't force them to talk about, they're not, you're not going to get much if you're talking about whatever you want to talk about. And then um, the other thing too that I wanted to mention is the lack of questions. I wanted to mention this before the videos, but you'll see in the the videos, if you can remember, never did I say, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? What do you want? What I asking questions is, um, it's, it's very natural to do that, but it's probably one of the least effective ways to really promote that long expanded, um, varied communication. Diane. That's right, Diane. Let's open it. A good mm, You see the stamp? Good. Mm -hmm. You gotta tear it. You gotta tear the envelope. Yeah, open it. Oh, can you do it? Oh man. You need some help? Help. Okay. So that was an example of expanding the utterances, just adding a few more words each time. And then I think Kirsten, is this, I'm going to hand it over to Kirsten to talk about the routines and how you can incorporate language into your daily routines. Okay, so we're just going to take the strategies that Andrew went over, expanding on language and talk about what you can do every day to work on these strategies. We often have parents saying that have children with language delays or they just wanna work on their language at home with their child and say, what do we do? How do we help with this? And we're just gonna tell you ways that you can do this, you know, in everyday life. You don't have to sit down and be like, okay, it's language time. These are things that you can do every day in your normal routine. Um, okay, so the first one is in the kitchen. Cooking is an awesome way, although sometimes it takes a little bit longer to cook with your child, but it is a great way to work on language and the kids love it. Um, so one thing you can work on is naming things, naming the ingredients, naming the tools in the kitchen, um, describing things. You can expand on the language. Oh, this looks so good. Ooh, this is slimy. This is mushy. Just so many descriptive words. It smells yummy. What's that sound? It's loud. You know, talking about that's loud and this is quiet. Um, explaining things, just that using that self-talk. Oh, you dropped the egg. It broke. And not panicking about it and just saying, oh, this is what happened. Now we need to clean it up. Um, comparing things, talking about, oh, how water feels wet and the flour is dry giving directions, is, being in the kitchen and baking is a great time to work on giving directions naturally. Pour the water in the bowl, now stir it. Um, it. You know, even getting out the ingredients. Okay, let's look at our recipe, what do we need? Oh, let's get some flour, where's the flour? And just talking about different locations in the kitchen. Um, and then the next thing is predicting. So just predicting, what do you think is gonna happen when we put this um, you know, this, these cookies in the oven and um, just talking about, you know, making predictions. What would happen if we left the ice on the counter? And then talking about later, oh, look what happened, it melted. And then, you know, you can build on asking them questions like, why do you think that 
melted, you know, because it's, it's hot out here and it needs to be cold. So just working on those language skills in the kitchen is a great time. The next one is working on language skills during bath time. All kids love to, most kids love to take a bath. Um, you can work on so much during that naming body parts, putting some toys in the, in the bathtub, putting things that maybe aren't typically in the bathtub, um, you know, kitchen tools are fun, stirring and measuring and pouring, um, working on description. Oh, your hair is wet. Oh, you know, now we need to use a towel to dry your hair. Um, where's the soap? It's under the washcloth. So really describing um, using location words and descriptive words and explaining things. Again, you can work on comparing. Oh, your hands are clean and your hair is dirty. Your body's wet and your hair is dry. So really, you know, talking about opposites, you know, pouring water. Oh, this one's full and now it's empty. Uh, working on requesting, maybe hold back some of the toys in the bathtub or cups to pour with and have your child ask for those things. Uh, giving directions first, you know, tilt your head back, and then I need to rinse your hair, um, and then first wash your hands, and then wash your feet. So really giving them directions to follow. Again, predictions. What do you think will happen to the soap? Do you think it will sink or float? Um, and then pretending. Oh, bathroom is a fun time to pretend. Pretending you're in the ocean and putting, bringing in maybe some um, ocean animals into the bathtub is a, a great time to play while you're still getting through the day and, and give, giving your child a bath, which is one of the things you have to do every day. The next opportunity is getting dressed. Again, you can work on naming your body parts and naming clothing. Oh, what do we need to put on your feet? Oh, we need socks. Um, describing clothes, you know, talking about socks matching, are they the same or are they different? You want long, short, long socks or short socks, um, you know, striped socks or plaid socks. Dirt, are these dirty? Or are they clean? Where do we put them when they're dirty? Um, you know, just explaining, let your child make decisions when, when you can, as much as you can, on what they should wear that day. You know, talking about the weather. Maybe they want to wear shorts. Take them outside for a few minutes and see, oh, it's cold outside. How does this feel? And, you know, kind of working through that. This is why we need to wear our pants today or why we need to wear a coat today. It's cold outside. Or, you know, sometimes they have those favorite clothes that are just too small. Let them put it on instead of just telling them that's too small. Let them try it and see, look, oh, that is so tight. Um, you know, requesting, have them ask for certain clothes if they're up high in the closet and they have a favorite shirt, you know, encourage them to ask for that. Giving directions, uh, pretending with dress up clothes. They love to dress up in mom and dad's clothes. That's a, a fun opportunity to practice um, naming clothes and talking about different sizes of things. And then just letting them express their opinions and giving them choices. Uh, do you want the blue shirt or the red shirt? Just giving them lots of opportunities to build on that language. The laundry, that is a part of life that is never going away. And definitely a part that you can welcome your child into uh, the laundry experience by naming clothing items, describing them, the white clothes go in this basket, oh, these clothes are dirty, these are clean, let's compare socks, we need to find the ones that match. Um, you can sort them by sizes or clothes or by people in your house, oh, this is daddy's, this is mommy's, um, letting them deliver all the laundry to the different rooms. Uh, again, giving directions, predicting, uh, show them a dirty shirt before you put it in the washing machine. What do you think is going to happen? And then pulling it out, look, the dirt is gone. And really, you know, trying to build just language experiences into everyday routines. Um, the other, the, the, the three big, or the two biggest things I always tell parents is how do they work on language skills? Playing with your child and reading are the two biggest ones. Reading books, oh, we can't do that enough. Reading books with your child is the best way to encourage language development. It gives you that one-on-one -on -one time. It you know, removes you from the busyness of life and just sitting down with a book is just great for language development. 
Um, try to build that into your routine. You know, when my girls were little, we always, always read books before they went to bed. That was just a natural time in our day that we, we would incorporate reading. Um, reading multiple books at a time and reading it over and over again. That repetition really helps them um, develop that, develop language and just the, the love for reading, pre-reading skills. Give your child choices, hold up two books and ask your child which one she wants, he or she wants to read. Um, and then there's just different levels of book reading. So in the beginning, you might just look at it and identify and name pictures. Oh, show me the cow. Where's the pig? And just having having them point to it, or you know, pointing to something and saying, "What is this?" and have them name it. Um, identifying objects by functions. Ooh, where? What do what does the um, what do we eat? Point to the one that we eat, or point to the one that that drives. Finding a car. Um, answering WH questions about the story after you've read it or while you're reading it, asking questions, have your child just describe the picture. So don't even read the words, just, just talk about it, you know, naturally and talk about what you see and encourage your child to do, to do the same. And then a later developing thing is um, to do with your child when reading is just working on their narrative skills. So after you read the book, go back over it and say, oh, let's talk about what happened in that book. What happened first? Who are the characters in the story? You know, what happened next? And, and encourage your child to retell that story in the, in the correct order. And here's just, um, these are my girls and, um, or one of my girls, but um, this is just her showing that we've read this book a lot and she start, you know, she's, I don't know, one and a half maybe, and she starts to go through the book and just kind of, wait, well, you can watch it and see. <laughs> developing her reading skills um, you know obviously she doesn't know how to read yet but she you know she could was even using the gestures which I probably did when I was reading when she said you know in the not in the dark so like using gestures and, and animated when you read it just kind of not the dark um, so you can see that she kind of picks up on that and that helps her get that language out and then the Pete the cat you know the more repetitive a book is and they feel so proud to be able to just memorize the book and be able to read it, um, read it back to you. Okay, and then play. That is the other big, big time to be working on language skills. And I like this, play 101. If you feel like an idiot, you're doing it right. I mean, we, we do sound silly at Barfield when we're playing with the kids and, um, you know, the sillier, the better. They, they love it. And getting down to your child's level, just observing them um, and, and reaching them on their level. Don't feel like you need, like Andrea said before, do not feel like you need to fill every moment of silence with a question. Drilling them with questions it does not bring out that natural language. So you really want to think about using three to one. So three comments to one question. So you know, it would be even better just to do, you know, self-talk or parallel talk. 
talk when you're um, playing with them, just kind of describing what they're doing rather than, you know, what are you doing? But really just kind of giving them the language describing what they're doing. Follow your child's lead, comment on, like I said, comment on what they're doing, use the simple language and model new vocabulary words. The car is driving on the bridge. Whoa, it is so fast. Just filling, you know, describing whatever it is they're doing so that they have the language to talk about it. Uh, modeling appropriate ways to play. For example, show your child that, that the car can drive on the road and make several pit stops at buildings and the car sometimes crashes. Um, just being silly and using sound effects. Um, and you know, sometimes kids, maybe your child really likes to play with trains, but really pulling in other things with the trains, like, oh, um, you know, at school you're learning about apples, let's take the train to the apple orchard, or, you know, really, you know, taking your child's interest and bringing two things together and, and starting to bridge, and maybe they'll see that they enjoy going to the apple orchard and playing in the plate, you know, and picking apples and, and playing like that. So by exposing them gradually, bringing in their favorite toys with new ideas, that might, might help build their play repertoire. Um, and then this just kind of goes in, incorporate routine language, up, 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 down, you know, put the pig in the barn. You can work on like spatial concepts. Ooh, let's hide the pig behind the barn. Um, you know, repeating what your child says clearly. And like Andrea said, you know, just adding those one to two words to increase their utterance based on where they're at. If they're talking in one word, then add one more word. If they're talking in two to three, then add two more descriptive words to your sentences. And in today's day and age, it's always nice to see Fred Rogers quote. I'll let you read that, but. And here's some silly play with an ant. This is a former SLP's son and she's, he's playing with his aunt. Lisa? Ha! <laughs> Mom! Was that hilarious? Mom! Hilarious? Okay, so that was a great introduction into play. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the toys um, that you can be using at home. So uh, we really wanted to incorporate some things that you already have. So we, we never want parents to feel like they have to have, you know, the biggest and the best. And all these, you know, toy magazines are coming out right now in, in the mail. And kids obviously are looking through those and saying, I want this, I want this. Um, and we are here to tell you that the simpler, the better. So toys with less bells and whistles facilitate so much more language than toys that light up, toys that speak, toys that have buttons, um, toys that are you know, making lots of noise. Um, those toys that do have buttons and speak are okay every once in a while, for a, but for a child who um, has difficulty communicating, there's not a lot of interaction that goes with that. They're able to uh, make the toy uh, go off. So they press a button, it's an immediate gratification. You know, they see the lights, they hear the sounds. Um, so they, they're not having to, you know, really think about how to expand their play or, or how it works. So um, that's kind of our little spiel on toys. And 
let's talk a little bit more about some things that you have at home and how you can incorporate some of those good play strategies. Okay, so um, if you have a farm set at home, this is a really great tool to be using imaginative play. So um, a lot of our farm sets, you know, it's just, it's a farm, it are, it's some animals, it's a fence, you know, maybe you can make your own duck pond with just a piece of construction paper. All of these things to kind of build your child's imagination. imagination. Um, and there are very little sounds that are involved because we want you to be making the sounds with the farm animals um, to give your child those models at home. So you can work on pretend skills. Uh, you can pretend that the animals are eating, drinking, or riding a tractor. Um, you can pretend that they're running through the field. Um, you can make the farmer take care of the animals by feeding them, by brushing them, helping when they get hurt. So talk about all the different jobs that a farmer might have on the farm, um, and it really opens up a, a good conversation. So you can obviously make choices. Mm, I want the horse. What do you want? The pig or the cow? And use that waiting strategy. Give your child a little bit of time. Let them choose. And if they don't choose, maybe you could say, oh, I saw you look at the cow. Do you want the cow? Hold it up for them and then say, cow. And it's okay if your child isn't repeating or isn't speaking back to you, but still giving them those models and that very clear, concise language so that they hear it, they see the cow, and they're making those associations is really important. Um, if your child is not speaking, using uh, am animal sounds in your play is a really great way to facilitate that. It's a, a great building bridge um, to using words. So um, obviously imitating the sounds of the animals, imitating sounds of the tractor, imitating um, sounds of you know things falling over, whoa! Using big expressions um, is really going to draw your child in and, and make them a little bit more engaged. Uh, if you're working on understanding language because children need to have the understanding of a concept before they're able to express it. So maybe you can work on identifying animals um, before labeling them. So get the cow. Yes, that's a cow. What is it? It's a cow. So identifying animals, identifying their attributes. Find one that says moo. Find the pink animal. Find one with feathers. Really think about the parts of different things. Um, follow directions. So using spatial concepts. Okay, put the horse in the barn. Put the cow behind the barn. Um, and asking WH questions. Where is it? What does the farmer drive? Who feeds the, the animals on the farm? Um, when does the rooster crow? Things like that. And then telling a story or acting out a story about the farm animals. So the farmer wakes up in the morning and then he goes to milk the cow. When he's done milking the cow, he feeds the chicken and he collects the eggs. <gasps> Time for breakfast. And then he feeds the family. So, um, you know, kind of giving your child a, a beginning, a middle, and maybe an end to, um, just to repeat back to you. Um, hey Marie, we also, yes. So I just want to say one thing, cause what you're saying, it's so like in the classroom, um, I think that wait time is so, so, so important. And I think so many times we just assume they're not going to say it because the past five times they haven't said it. And so, like you said, like, just wait for it because it's incredible that sometimes we shortchange them and sometimes we move a little too fast because we're just assuming that it's going to be like the previous five times and then we just took away that opportunity so like i really really urge parents to like wait even just a couple seconds longer and you just never know and i think a lot of times you're worried that you're going to lose that um excitement and things like that and most of the time the pauses are what builds like it's that anticipation of what's going to happen, what's coming next and all of that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to chime in because I think that's 
so important and, and like a second feels like forever and it really isn't forever. And that waiting, that kind of awkward time in the middle might give your child an opportunity to look at you. So they're giving you joint attention and they're kind of thinking, what's going to happen next? What's she going to, you know, is it my turn to say something? Oh, I, I think I say something and they might, even if they, you know, make some kind of vocalization, that's, that's better than nothing. You know, that's a baby step in the right direction. So yes, great ideas, Tara. Um, and something that I, I guess I, I didn't really talk about, but is also super important in play is following your child's lead and really thinking about what are they interested in. So um, in, in the video, uh, which we showed at the beginning um, of Andrea's presentation where um, the mom had the blocks and she said, oh, it's a snake, I like snakes. She had kind of her own agenda and she wasn't, her son was, you know, trying to play with something and she really wasn't paying any attention to what he was into. Children are going to learn about what they're interested in and what they're into. So really keep that in mind. If your child is into, you know, maybe something specific in the dollhouse, maybe it's a ladder, make different things climb the ladder, make animals climb the ladder, make people climb the ladder. Just um, really thinking about, you know, incorporating and expanding on what your child is interested in is really going to uh, build their language. So in a dollhouse, we can use pretend play, obviously, by reenacting things that your kid sees every day. You can, you know, go to bed, eat dinner, take a bath, um, model things first, and then prompt your child to imitate. So even if your child is not speaking yet, you can still model good night and put the doll in the bed and then wait, maybe look at them and maybe they'll put the doll in the bed too. So really waiting for them to imitate using a lot of great eye contact, kind of like, it's your turn or what do you think? What will happen next? Those are really powerful tools to use when we're playing. Um, and use language that you might use at home too. What do you say when it's time for dinner? What do you say when it's time for bed? Build those in and, and you'll be, um, you know, I think surprised at what your child is picking up at home too. You can use dollhouses and people for making choices. Do you want the boy or the girl? Should we play with the bed or the chair? And remember, use that waiting strategy. Um, identifying items by function, so a kind of a higher level language processing skill. Show me something you sit on. Show me something you take a bath in. Uh, following directions is great to work on in the dollhouse. Open the door, give the boy a bath, and put him to bed. So really starting with just simple things. Maybe it's just put the boy in bed, put the girl in bed, and then giving maybe two-step directions. So give the boy a bath, then put him in bed. So maybe build on your natural uh, routine of your day so that your child can kind of build on his or her own experiences. Um, you can use, work on using different verbs, so modeling things, eating, drinking, cooking, watching, opening, um, things like that. And, and it's really important to model in uh, the verb, the ING verb tense. So um, it's a, at, at the beginning stages of language, children um, start picking up ing. So we, they might say running, jumping. If your child is not doing that yet, a way to facilitate it is to, is to say, oh, look, boy is eating, girl is sleeping, um, the dog is, and waiting for your child, and maybe they'll say jumping, so kind of using that same verb tense. Um, using spatial concepts, in, on, under, in front, and behind telling a story about what your dolls are doing, um, and then asking questions. What is she doing? Where is she going? Who is sleeping? When are they going to bed? Why are they taking a bath? Um, things like that. Okay, uh, vehicles are something we use a lot in my house because I have a, a two-year-old little boy who is obsessed with transportation right now. So, are we live in transportation land. 
uh, we pretend to drive around the town. We talk about where we're going. I'm going to the gas station. Let's fill up the gas. Um, we uh, kind of before, as Kirsten was saying, I'll, I'll bring the vehicles into different place situations. So, um, or trains, you know, maybe there's a train that's going around the farm and we talk about what we see. Oh, I see a pig. Here comes the train, chugga choo choo, stop train. Oh, what does he see now? I see chickens. And then the train keeps going. So think about other way, you know, other uh, kind of scenarios you can bring your, your vehicles or transportation into as well. So you can work on imitating vehicle sounds if your child is not speaking yet, making choices, identifying the names of the vehicles, um, and labeling the vehicles, so following directions. Uh, if your children are really squirrely and love to move, you can, you know, say things like drive it around the couch and come back or drive it into the kitchen, um, things like that. So, you know, it doesn't have to be confined into one area. Using spatial concepts, driving in, on, and under, um, and then answering WH questions. What are you driving? Where is it going? Who is driving that train? Those are all great ways um, to expand on your child's language. And then blocks are something very simple that a lot of us have at home. And it's a great tool for creating, you know, different things. We, we really have to use our imagination with blocks. So you can make a house or a zoo or a farm and incorporate other things like cars and dolls and animals. Um, you can imitate lots of sound effects. Boom, crash, up, 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 down. And using a lot of routine language here um, is a great way for your children to kind of uh, fill it in. So, all right, I'm going to put the block on, put this block on, put this block on. So really waiting for them and giving them an opportunity to fill that phrase in themselves is very helpful too. Uh, you can work on identifying names, shapes, colors, and numbers following directions. So put, put the green block on top, put the red block next to the green block, things like that. Um, and then using different concepts. Oh, my tower is, tor is tall, yours is short. Using spatial concepts um, and then answering WH questions. What are you making? Who lives there? Um, where should I put this? Okay, so moving on from toys, we wanted to talk a little bit about using visuals at home. So um, pictures are something that we love to prom promote language. So some kids learn differently. Kids might learn auditorily, they might learn through tactile means, and a lot of people, including myself, I learn very well visually. So I like to see something, and a lot of children, I think, feel this way too. So um, using pictures, are a great way to promote language. Um, you can have pictures of your child's favorite food maybe on the refrigerator. So if your child is not yet speaking, you might save um, even just cutting out like the box, the goldfish on a box of goldfish and having pasting that on a piece of paper next to, you know, a picture of your child's favorite cereal or something. Having them, having your child be able to um, initiate by touching the picture is a really powerful tool. It gives them a lot of um, uh, independence uh, with their language. So that's, that's something great that you can try at home. Um, if your child does not have the language to say milk, maybe you can have them point to a picture instead and just repeat it back to them. Oh, you want the milk. And then, um, you know, when they point to it, always pair it with a verbalization. Using a pacing board is a great way to expand utterances as well. So a pacing board is um, just several dots um, or several kind of blocks, several of anything really, to just show that one word is represented by one item. So you can have your child touch each item as they say each word. 
So for example, at the bottom, this sentence strip says, may I have a, um, so it has the words at the bottom, something we always have on ourselves, our fingers. So maybe you can point to your fingers instead. May I have a cookie? And then um, your child can repeat that sentence back to you if they're able. Okay, and then in early childhood, we are using a lot of core communication boards. So these boards are filled with these core words and core words are words that make up a lot of um, our phrases and our utterances. So words like I, want, I'm all done, more, on, up, these are words especially that are um, used a lot in a preschool classroom. So um, it is, it's basically a visual representation of language. And when children aren't able to speak, they're able to uh, touch a word kind of in place of that. So you can have, you can model the language as you say it. So if you can work on a phrase, maybe I want, and then a uh, goldfish, let's say it's snack time. So you can touch, I want goldfish, and your child sees the picture for I, the picture for want, they see the goldfish, they hear your sentence. There are a lot of uh, modalities happening there, so um, there's a greater likelihood that that language is going to stick. Uh, when students, uh, you can model language as you say it, so you can model things like go, uh, let's put something in, I want more. Um, and these pictures are in the same location on the board all the time so that uh, children start to understand and learn the motor plan behind them. So they might not be able to say more, but they know that location of that word. And I've seen a lot of students, um, you know, go to that area of the board and touch more, even if they don't necessarily know how to say it, they know that that is the picture of more and they know that that's the location of it. So um, it, it's, it's a great tool for learning. So, um, and using these core words, we, we use them because we can communicate a lot of different purposes um, with them. So for example, when we use the word go, um, it can be used for so many more purposes than using the word car. So you can say, let's go outside, let's go for a snack, let's go to bed, um, let's go in the house. And when you're learning a word like car, it only applies to one singular item, a car. Um, so this is why we're teaching these words um, a little bit earlier than we are some of those other nouns and verbs. Okay, and here's a great example of Miss Andrea using a core board in her classroom. And Marie, can I? Oh, we're gonna play. Sorry, I just wanted to say, point out a couple of things to look for on this video. Um, the first one is that it's not just for naming things. Um, you know, I hope that we are using this for commenting, for answering questions. And then you'll also notice that never do I expect him or make him point to anything on the board. It's more about modeling, just like our verbal language in those previous videos. We model, 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 and eventually that child um, also imitates that same behavior. So I just wanted to point that out. The barn game. So you tell me, what color do you want? That's not blue, that is red. Red. Yes, good. Okay, there's red. Now you pick another color. You pick again. What color is that? Blue. Blue. Good job. Okay, now these are going to be my colors. What color do I have? What color do I have? Yellow. Good. And yellow. And what color, what other color do I have? Green. Green. Thank you. Okay, let me move that. All right, I have yellow and green. You have blue and red. Okay, who's going first? Who's going first? PJ, say me. Me. Okay, here you go. Open. 
Open the barn. Oh, what did you get? You did get blue. What is that? It's a blue. Go over here. It's a blue cow. Blue cow. All right, here you go. Do you need a blue cow? Yes. Nice job. Okay, whose turn? My turn. You can say you. Here I go. I'm going to open the barn. Oh, that one's mine. Oh, look what I got. What color? Yellow. Good. A yellow what animal? Sheep. I got a yellow sheep. And I need a yellow sheep. All right. Whose turn? Whose turn? It's your turn. See? My turn. Yeah, you can do it. Here, use your hand. My turn. All right. Open the barn. Open. You do it. Open the barn. It's right here. Uh-oh. Try again. All right, what'd you get? Yeah. Red. Good. What's the animal? Let's see. You got a red. Look over here. You got a red. DJ, look over here. You got a red cow. Yeah. Red cow. Good. Do you need a red cow? Yes. You do. Put on your red cow. Good match. Okay, whose turn is it? All right, I love that video. There are just so many great things modeled there. That child had so many opportunities to request where he otherwise might not have because he has that tool in front of him. So um, great job, Andrea. <laughs> okay, um, if your child attends Barfield or if they do in the future, you might see some activities sent home um, kind of in this calendar for, format. And we just like to give lots of great ideas for you know parents to try simple language activities at home. And this is just an example of that. Um, I think we're we're running a little bit short on time here, so I think we'll just pass through this video if you guys are okay with that. It's really cute, but and try to move it along. Okay, and then we wanted to say a little bit about speech or articulation. So this has to do with the actual sounds that um, we make. So um, articulation is the formulation of clear and distinct sounds, and phonology is the system of relationships among these sounds. So in Missouri, um, we are going to refer uh, children for a speech evaluation if they do not have these sounds at age four. So um, P, B, M, H, and W are what we're looking at at age four. So keep in mind um, that last year the regulations were changed um, and that the state wanted to give students an additional year to acquire these sounds. So they're saying that even though you know these sounds should be in your child's repertoire at three years old, they're allowing children an extra year of acquisition to give them a little bit of time to develop before we say it's, it's a true speech delay. So at four, we're looking for these sounds. At four, six, we want to add N, K, D, and F. Um, at five years old, we're adding T and G. And at six years old, we are adding Y, V, and F. Um, and as always, if you have any concerns with your child's speech, contact your parent educator for a screening or your speech and language pathologist at Barfield or your teacher. Okay. To help improve a child's speech at home or in the classroom, you can talk all the time. The more a child hears correct speech, the more likely they are to attempt to reproduce it. What goes in comes out. Speak calmly and clearly. 
This gives the child a chance to hear clear, accurate speech. Look at the child when speaking. This gives the child a chance to see your mouth and how specific sounds are made so that they can then mimic those sounds. Bonus points if you use a mirror so the child can see their own mouth while making the sounds. Play and make sounds. We want children to have fun and learn through play. If you're playing with a snake, make the snake sound S to practice S. If you're playing with a train, make the train sound ch, ch, ch to practice CH. It's also really important to repeat what the child says. Say what the child said without the speech error so that they have a chance to hear the sounds correctly. If the child says, I dropped my cup, you would repeat the child and say, you dropped your cup, adding that P sound on the end of cup. Have the child show you. If you can't understand what a child is saying, sometimes it helps to have them show you or give you examples when possible. Sometimes when you have more information about the topic or context, it's easier to figure out what the child is saying. Once you know what he's saying, be sure to repeat the sentence so that the child has an accurate example of the speech sounds. Get on the child's level. Again, this allows the child to see more easily how the sounds are correctly produced. Break a longer word into sections. This can be done for short words, mad, for mad, or basket ball for basketball. Be aware of ear infections. I'm putting this on the list because ear infections greatly affect how well a child can hear. Remember, what goes in is oftentimes what comes out. If a child is listening to speech that sounds garbled for too long, they may learn how to speak in that garbled way. If your child or a child in your class has an ear infection in his right ear, Try to speak on his left side instead so he's hearing correct productions. Okay, so um, that was a, a video on how to um, model clear speech for your children. Um, and we wanted to say um, a little bit about stuttering. And this is something that comes up often in, in early childhood years and parents aren't sure, you know, if it, is it something typical or is it something atypical? Should we look a little bit more at the stuttering? Um, and the reason why it shows up in early childhood many times is because children's, children experience this huge language burst. Um, and it, it's almost as if they're, you know, having to think a little bit more and, and process language a little bit faster too. So um, things that are typical as, in regard to stuttering is um, word repetitions and phrase repetitions. So um, your child saying, I, 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 I want milk, um, things like that. And then using filler words like um and like, those are things that are, are very typical, especially in this age. Um, things that are not as typical um, is if the stutter is happening for more than six months to a year, um, if there's a family history, if, you know, mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, or uncle are um, lifelong stutterers, then we would like to take a closer look at the stuttering. Uh, are there sound or syllable repetitions? So do they say milk instead of milk? Uh, is there a physical struggle when they're stuttering? Does it appear that they're kind of strained and as if they can't get the sound or the word out? Are there secondary characteristics? Are, is there facial grimacing? Do they look away from you? Is there eye contact avoidance? Um, and are there lots of types of disfluencies? Do they have sound repetitions, prolongations, and blocks? Are they kind of trying to get a word out and physically stuck on a specific sound? And do they feel negatively towards their speech? Um, do they have kind of a, a negative reaction um, or view or self-esteem, you know, if you will, towards their own communication. And then, and those are some instances where we would want to take a closer look at it. Um, things you can do to model good fluency or to help a child who you think is stuttering is to model, you know, those good speech habits. So slowing down, uh, modeling very slow speech, giving extra time and being patient model fluent, fluent sentences. Um, do not interrupt them or stop them. Um, do not rush them because that will make them, you know, 
probably have more disfluencies, do not finish what they're saying and do not point out their disfluencies. Okay, so I think we'll, we'll kind of leave you with this video. Um, and it's, it's pretty important about being a parent in this age, so. How is school? I learned the monkey bars. That's great. Music is so important. We did finger painting. To take a camera or something. Yeah, take some pictures. We're going on a one-way field trip to Mars. Let us know if you need a chaperone. Take the device-free dinner challenge. A common sense okay, idea. So we've from all seen, you know, those parents at dinner, and and I'm sure every one of us have been those parents at some time or another. Um, so you know, we don't feel judged, but just you know, remind yourself that your children see you, and that interaction is really key when they're learning and developing language. Um, we do have a few resources that we'll share with you all afterwards. Um, and then I think several questions came up as well. So I'm not sure if, if you other girls want to hop on and kind of help me out with these. So um, let's see, I know the first one, someone was looking for assessment tips for an 18 month old, uh, a boy not speaking many words. He's being raised in a Spanish speaking home and he's exposed to English through TV and outside world. Um, so something that we wanted to bring up was just to, you know, continue modeling language uh, in Spanish the same way that you would in English. Um, you know, it might take the child a little bit longer to process because he's processing two languages and that's okay. So, um, you know, always keep in mind to give him a little bit of extra wait time, um, providing you know, maybe providing uh, the dual language, so providing something in Spanish and then in English, um, things like that. Do you, do you all have anything else to add? Well, I was just gonna say the same techniques that we've talked about work in English and any other language. So using all of those strategies that we talked about early on and the play strategies, um, using all of those strategies, even if you're speaking Spanish, is going to promote language growth. Okay, and then um, someone wanted to know some tips and tricks to get their child a little bit more engaged and focused um, because their three-year-old is having a hard time giving, a, giving his full attention. And that is so common. Um, we hear that from a lot of parents and it's really tricky. But we do think that shared book reading is one of the best ways uh, to get your child engaged and to you know, have something very direct to focus on. Um, maybe he can sit in your lap so he's getting a little bit more of the sensory input too. Um, that would be, you know, one idea. Um, sometimes doing, using a one more strategy. So um, just to kind of gradually increase his attention. So if you're doing a puzzle and he likes to put one in and run away, say, oh, we're going to do one more. Let's do one more together. Um, things like that. Is there anything else you girls would like to add? Um, I think just making sure that you gain eye contact. If there's something that you want him to pay attention to, I know at Barfield we use the words eyes watching so they know those words. Um, you know, making sure that you get the eye contact before you talk to um, he or she and just making sure that you make the effort to get the attention focused before you have an expectation. Um, there was something else. Oh, and if you, you know, it, at my house, I find timers work wonders. If there's something, you know, that's not necessarily a joint attention piece, but something you need them to attend to, to finish an activity, like maybe it's cleaning up. A lot of times you can say, I'm going to set a timer and see how long it takes you or see if you can beat your time from yesterday or see if you can do it under the under three minutes or let's do this puzzle together. We'll set a timer and see how long it takes us. That can be really useful too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then another question we had was what strategies can we do at home to help speech and language development for kids with suspected childhood apraxia of speech? Um, so this is something tricky, but we always tell parents to work on um, vowels at home. So being a good speech model and really modeling vowels. So maybe you can model it in a mirror um, with some a really exaggerated facial ex expressions um, and motor movements too. So, ooh, and then waiting for your child to kind of imitate that in a mirror. Um, you know, just being really silly with that. Maybe imitating other motor movements that go along with it. Um, could be really helpful as well. And um, choosing just a few very important words to that child to work on at a time. So, um, you know, maybe your child wants to learn how to say his or her name or, you know, a, a favorite toy and a favorite food. Maybe just focusing on those three words. Um, and if it's, if they aren't able to say the entire word, it's okay. Maybe just focusing on the beginning sound or the beginning syllable. Um, so just think about pairing those words down to make them a little bit simpler for your child to say. Would you guys like to add or? Well, and anything that you can do repetitive, so repetitive books and any play that you can have your child say the same thing over and over again, it gets that motor pattern going. And then also um, using those visual supports, like that core communication board, to give them success to like have the visual support to help pair the, you know, that motor plan and get them to say it more successfully. Okay, and I think, was there another page or? I think that's it. Were there any other questions um, from the crowd? Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, um, we I just want everyone to know, so we'll, um, this is on YouTube, so there will be a link, especially for our families who were unable to join us. I know a lot of them were saying that they could watch it at a later date um, and share it with your relatives and things like that. Just so if your kiddos are struggling and, you know, maybe dad didn't get to watch this or grandma watches your kids, um, these are all, great strategies that anybody can do. So um, please share because it's wonderful information. So um, ladies, you're wonderful and thank you so much. And sorry, I didn't have my camera on to start it off. I didn't realize that. Um, and then Addie, is there anything else I'm missing? They'll get a feedback form, right? That they can yes. fill. Yep, I will email the feedback form. Um, the stream to YouTube is not working. Of course, so I recorded this, so the link on YouTube will be up by tomorrow morning. It takes a little bit, um, but everyone will get a feedback form. And then I just wanted to chime in. You guys, you ladies were amazing. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, let's see, next week, Wednesday the 18th, we're going to talk about brain and motor development. Um, and in December, if anybody has any sleep questions, December is your month. Uh, we're going from newborns all the way up to big kids. So we have some Mercy, St. Louis Mercy doctors and sleep technicians talking with us uh, in December. And so we hope to see you then. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, ladies. You were wonderful. So. All right, bye bye. Thank you. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, good. She just said thank you so much for all of the information. I just want to make sure. Oh, and the PowerPoint um, or Google site or whatever it is will also be emailed out to everybody. So that way you can have a physical copy as well for more information. So awesome. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.